It's shocking and sickening, but tragically it happens all too often. And that's when people who are in a position of trust do the unthinkable and abuse children. Jimmy Savile, as you know, at the moment is still all over the news. As more and more women are coming forward saying that they were abused by him, police are still investigating allegations that the TV star sexually abused over 300 young people over a 40-year period. Someone who is all too familiar with the trauma and scars that abuse leaves is Peter Saunders, who will be sharing his story and telling us about an organisation that he founded, NAPAC. That's the National Association for People Abused in Childhood. We also have on Stephanie Stedman, who was sexually abused when she was just a toddler. And we also have on Julia Webb Harvey, who supports families of child sexual abuse. So if you want to get in touch, this is a very sensitive topic and I believe it's one that really, really needs to be addressed and more shows need to be done like this. So if you want to share your views, if you've been a victim of abuse and you would like to share something or ask a question, you can also email Chris at chrissybisha.tv and you can also give us a call on 020 7686 We've got two great organisations here to help you tonight as well. So if you want more information as well about the show, you can visit chrissybisha.tv. But first, let's talk to Peter. Good evening, Peter. Good evening. Thanks how so are much you? for coming to the show. Thank you. I'm very well. First of all, I'd just like to say I think it's brilliant how brave you are to come on and talk about something so personal. But I know it's something that you know you deal with on a daily basis with your organisation. Sure. But first, tell us about um, how it was for you. How was your family and you know your you as a person before the abuse started? Well, it's such a long time ago. It's it's difficult to remember how it was before I was abused because mm. I'm in my fifties now, and the uh, the abuse started when I was just really very very young, when I was seven, and it went on until I was fourteen, mm -hmm. and I never spoke about it until I was nearly 40 years of age. So I kept it to myself throughout my, my adult life mm -hmm. and it was, it was something that triggered my memories. Right. That a, a little bit like you mentioned Jimmy Savile. Mm -hmm. You know, at NAPAC we've had thousands of people coming to us whose memories have been jogged, have been triggered by this story of, of, of abuse that's made headlines. So it's mm -hmm. quite common for people to suppress and to not address the issues, if they you They try like. to put it out of their minds, don't they? Absolutely. Because they just don't want Ab to face what actually happened to them. And exactly, I think because it's too, awful to, it's too awful to even yeah. bear thinking about. And as soon as you can get it out your head, I mean, you can't unfortunately get it out your head. Mm. You put it into a place and you hope that it goes away. But inevitably, it does come back and, and, and bites you. Do you and think you need some to get it out. people don't actually realise they, they were abused? And it just sort of when they start hearing different things, because I was watching some interviews with people mm. that were abused by Jimmy Savile, and they were describing certain things. Mm. And, I, and I don't know if maybe some people watching would, didn't, that happened to them and didn't actually realise it was abuse. They thought it was maybe just, I don't know, what they thought it was. Sure. But. I mean, again, at NAPAC, we hear lots of people's accounts of things that happened to them where they may say to us, I'm not, I'm not sure what happened to me. Mm -hmm. Now, we would never say, well, you know, you were abused. Only the person will know whether they yeah. were abused or not. And we wouldn't encourage somebody to believe something that didn't happen, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. But we let people explore their feelings and their emotions. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they will say, yes, I do remember something happening to me. I do remember, you know, my relative coming into my bedroom when I was small and touching me. And, and I've tried not to think about it, but I, I know it happened. Mm -hmm. and, and they may say to us, so was that abuse? And we say, well, you tell us whether you think yeah. it was abuse. Because if you're telling us 30, 40 years later that your, your uncle or your granddad or the babysitter came and did something to you that was wrong and you remember that, then the chances mm. are it, it, was it was clearly abuse and should never have happened. OK. Now, now in your case, it started when you were seven. This was someone uh, in the, within the family, Somebody wasn't it? close into my family unit. Right. Yeah who came into our family when I was that age mm -hmm. and, um, and got into a relationship with, with another member of my family. And basically, I think part of the reason for that person inveigling their way into our family was to get to me. And, and I'm convinced of that. Mm -hmm. And um, as I say, I was, he, it was a man and he abused me and, until I was finally able to actually stop the sexual abuse at 14, but even beyond 14, 
he then concentrated on mind games and trying to control me mm -hmm. by, you know, by alternative methods, if you like, by how he, how manipulating he... my mind. Because I was still a child. Yeah. I had come under this person's power when I was very, very mm -hmm. young. He was more like a father figure, if you like, than, than anything else. And someone who gave me, and again, this is something we hear from many survivors of abuses, that their abuser is often somebody who does good things for them, which is all yeah. part of the grooming process, mm -hmm. if you like. What kind of as things well did they used to do to try and get well, you on side? I mean, a, as a child growing up in the 60s, there wasn't a lot of money around. Mm. He would buy me gifts. He would give me pocket money. He would teach me to swim. He would let me play with, I mean, he'd been in the army. He let me play with real guns when so I was, was a it, child. Was, this, was he doing this before he started abusing you this, as well? This, well, and the, during the, as the, well. The, the gifts and the money were, that were something that happened very early on when he came mm. into our family. And that was a way of making me you know, like him big time, because when you're a child, and in those days, I'm going back a long time, mm -hmm. you maybe got a couple of presents at Christmas, and you got a couple of presents at birthday. Yeah. Uh, these days, children, my children, they get all sorts, and have had all sorts throughout the year, and they get bombarded with gifts. In, in, in the times I'm talking about, if somebody gave me the equivalent of five pounds, I would have felt I was a rich man, mm -hmm. and that was the kind of thing that he did mm -hmm. to make me feel good about him and so came under his control. How was it he was able, could, did this happen when your parents were home as well? Um, or how was, was he able to, to actually get to you to abuse you in that way? Ab ab abusers, Chris, are incredibly adept at covering their tracks, at appearing to be completely kind of responsible, normal, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, they're obviously not going to pay that much attention to the child in front of other adults, but just enough so that you get lulled into a false sense of security, if mm -hmm. you like. So let me take Pete off to teach him to swim. Mm -hmm. Most parents are gonna say, oh, that's really kind of mm -hmm. you. And it's so sad now that, that we have to be so aware that there are, well, we do have to be aware that, that there are people who will, as I say, inveigle their, their way into the life of the child, do good things, mm -hmm. take them on a holiday or a camping trip, but doing it entirely so that they can abuse the child. And that, that's that awful was because you just don't know who to trust. I mean, as I, I imagine what a nightmare it is for a parent. That's e exactly. Thinking, oh, I mean, thank be... goodness we, you know, we can trust most people. Yeah. You know, most people do not hurt children. Mm -hmm. Most people, children do not get abused. But sadly, there are a lot of perpetrators out there. And sadly, there are a lot of children who still get abused every year. Mm. So he, he was abusing you up until, sexually abusing you up until the age of 14. 14. Yep. Then after that, you said that stopped, but he kept, he continued traumatizing yep. you really. He, how, how, was, he, he how, how was he doing that? Well, he, as I said, he was a school teacher. I was a very impressionable, vulnerable youngster still. Mm -hmm. And I would believe anything that this man told me. So I believed when he said that I wouldn't achieve very much because I wasn't very bright because he was a school teacher and he would know things like that. Now these were all lies mm. but they were lies that I believed. Anything I took an interest in he would attack. I was very interested in, I mean as a teenager I was very interested in in my faith. You know I contemplated becoming a priest for example mm -hmm. and one night he attacked me, not physically but psychologically, he attacked me and, and said, you know, there's no God. You know, why would you want to be a priest? Now, this was coming from a man who goes to church every Sunday, mm -hmm. teaches at a church school and has priests as his friends and suddenly is attacking me because I dared to, cons to mention that I was thinking of becoming a mm -hmm. priest. It might all sound a bit bizarre and I was 15 or 16 at the time. Um, the sport that I was very involved in, I was quite good at the sport that I was involved in. But it wasn't a mainstream sport. So at school, where he was a teacher, the, the sports that you got a name in were rugby, cricket, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I was into an alternative sport. I was into cycling. And he told me, when I started to become very interested in bike racing, that I would never be any good at that either, that I didn't have the, you know, the confidence, the, the um, you know, just the ability. 
And again, when I look back, these, these, were, these were evil things to say because he was telling an impressionable course, young yeah. person that they weren't going to be any so good. To and I've had that since you. I was seven. Mm -hmm. So I knew it to be true. It wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't even in a position to be able to say, I'm going to prove you wrong. The only aspect where I tried to prove this person wrong, and again, it, it, it only fitted in very much later in my life, was I, although I left school at 16, um, and couldn't wait to get out, I, I did go back to university and I did get a degree and I did become a teacher. And the reason I became a teacher was because I wanted to prove him wrong mm. because he'd told me I was stupid and wouldn't amount to very much. Mm -hmm. And teachers in my eyes were clever people because he told me they were. Mm -hmm. You know, as it turned out, they're no cleverer than anybody else. They just do a different yeah. job. Some are very good, some are not so good. But I, so I went down that career path to prove my abuser wrong. Mm -hmm. And whether or not that's something I would have ended up doing, well, we'll, we'll never know. The only thing, I suppose, if, if there is a, a sort of silver lining to my personal circumstances was there were other children within our family who, had I not spoken out when I did 17 years ago, would have become his victims. There's no Why didn't doubt you speak earlier? Why because you, you, it was quite late when you actually did speak up. What, it, it what stopped you from talking in the first place when you were younger? It, it, never, it never occurred to me that I could speak out. Um, I wouldn't have had the words anyway because mm. I didn't really understand what was happening to me. And although, again, as an adult, I can look back and recognise what was going on was completely wrong, at the time, it was simply my life. Yeah. It was simply... When I was at their house, which I spent a lot of time at this person's house, he would come and abuse me. And I just kind of assumed that that's what people did to me. Mm -hmm. And that was my life. So I never questioned it. Also, I didn't have a very strong relationship with my mum and dad. My mum and dad were they, were, they were good people, but they'd had four children before me, mm -hmm. three children during the Second World War, so quite a bit before I was on the scene. And by the time I came along, I think my mum and dad weren't terribly interested in me. I think, well, I don't think, I know I was a mistake. I was mm. told I was a mistake. Again, not the oh most gosh. helpful thing for a child so to a grow child. up believing. <laughs> but yeah. that's what I remember being told that Parents I was... Parents need to I be was... so careful what they say to their kids, Ab right? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Something like that can just ruin their future. They just feel like they're, they're useless. They're not sure. meant to be here. My, you know? my, my father was an object of fear for me mm. because we were brought up in a very strict kind of Victorian disciplinarian household where if I did anything wrong I was caned mm -hmm. or slippered um, and it was the same at school of course I was brought up in an era where caning and, and being do you, do you think beaten if was, had a, was commonplace. a closer relationship with your parents that you would have spoken to them would you think your abuser had so much control of you that even if you had a great relationship with your parents you still wouldn't have spoken? Well it, it's kind of hard to imagine how it could have been different but had I had when I look back now and I see and I think about the relationship that some of my school friends had with their parents, mm. I can still remember going occasionally to my friends' houses when I was a boy and thinking, wow, these parents really love and connect with their kids. Mm. And, and I was allowed to go and play at their house. Children were never allowed to come and play at my house. So I was very much like mm. an only child, yeah. as it were, because my mum couldn't be bothered and dad was too busy working. Mm -hmm. and, and dad's main focus was, was discipline. So I wish that I'd had the kind of relationship with my parents that I hope my kids have got with, with me, me and yeah. their mother and, and many other parents have got with their children that mm -hmm. is one of uh, obviously being a parent but having no secrets. And, mm -hmm. and being able to talk about things. I, it, it never occurred to me that I could speak to my parents. And with the priests, for example, at the school, which was when I was 14, 15, at, at my secondary school. So these are the, the these, priests these, that, that abused you That abused well. me, yeah. That I subsequently found out abused many other boys. Mm -hmm. And I think there might be a book coming out sometime in the next year or two that's going to document a lot of this. Yeah. Um, I've kind of slightly lost where I was going with that. <laughs> but, 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 yeah, had I spoken, looking back, had I spoken out about the priests, yeah. 
I will never know what my dad's reaction would have been. My dad was a very, very devout Roman Catholic. The church was everything to, to him, you know. And um, I wonder whether he would have believed me or not. Now, I'd like to think he's long dead. I would like to think that my dad would have believed me and he would have gone straight to the police or to the school or wherever. But it didn't occur to me that I could have spoken out because priests in our community were like the next thing to God or the nearest yeah. thing to God. So you didn't, you didn't question them, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't look at them in we the eye. We need to question everyone, don't we? It doesn't matter what position or authority Absolutely. they hold. They, they, they've got a responsibility to, to treat people right. And it sickens me that they abuse that authority. It's awful. Yeah. I'm talking about teachers, priests, yes. other religions, other religious leaders. It's yeah. awful because they, yeah. they hide behind that yes. title. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I do believe in God. I'm not like I, I go to church and, you know, if I if I was to see something, I would speak up. I don't care who you are. Sure. And I think people are afraid are afraid to do that sometimes. Yes. Because, but it's not about, you know, the church or the you need, it's that individual that's there exactly. that's exactly. that needs to be brought to justice. Exactly. I'm, I'm like you. I mean, I believe in God. I have a faith, mm -hmm. but I don't believe in religion. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that men wearing skirts and costumes has got anything to do with, with a relationship yeah, with God. exactly. If you have a relationship with God and you believe it's between you and God mm -hmm. and there's no intermediaries and yeah. that's what religion does and that's exactly. where these men have, Taken and women, so, and women yeah. you know, I've heard of some pretty cruel nuns in my time as well, have, have, have carved themselves out a, a career that brings them into, act, into contact mm -hmm. with, with children and vulnerable people and, and that's that. perfect for abusing. A bit like Jimmy Savile carved yeah. out the perfect f career to, to mm. abuse hundreds and hundreds of people. Peter, you're going to stay with us because we're going to go to a quick break because Please. you actually confronted your abuser as well. We're going to speak about that afterwards. And we've also got Stephanie Stedman joining us who was abused when she was just a toddler. So she'll be joining us after this. Welcome back to the Chrissy Bishop. We're speaking about child abuse now i know this uh topic is very very sensitive so if you don't want to get in touch if you want some numbers to you know to call um you can give us a call here 020 you can also email chris at chrissybshow.tv um we're going to be speaking more to our guests but it is really really important that you do speak to someone if something that you know we talk about here strikes a nerve you remember something don't keep it to yourself. Do speak to someone because that is the way, you know, to your recovery and, you know, for you to not to let it destroy your life anymore. Please, please do speak up. And, you know, there's lots and lots of organisations nowadays that you can speak to. Now, now we have joined us Stephanie Stedman, who was also abused as a child. Good evening, Stephanie. Thanks so much for coming to the show. Thanks for having me. And for your bravery as well for talking about something like this. So when did the abuse start in your life? Um, I was a victim um, as a toddler, as you said. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of the abuse I don't remember specifically. Um, when I was around five or six, I was adopted um, and I started speaking to my mum about some things that I remembered, mm -hmm. uh, things that perhaps a five or six year old wouldn't know about um, in relation to uh, sort of genitalia mm -hmm. um, and my mum sort of obviously was really worried about it and uh, contacted social services and they were able to say that actually they hadn't mentioned um, the abuse that had happened um, despite me being in oh, hospital. So they, they'd know? <laughs> um, yes, it. yes, they, they did know about it but I, I mean I don't know if you've heard about it but a lot of um, so social services or, or, or councils prefer to, to withhold some information if they think that that could jeopardise the young person or the child being placed mm. um, in a fitting home as they, yeah, so that, that information was withheld um, and right. I was so, able so to they, tell So they confirm at what age you were being abused. Yes, yes, wow. so I was a toddler while, whilst I was in my mum's care. Um, she had sort of mental health issues, so mm. she wasn't always aware of what was going on. Um, she suffered from bipolar and um, has sort of various visitors coming to the house and, and obviously one of those was the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. So then growing up, did the abuse stop at that point or were you yep, so abused after yes. that? Yes, so um, my nan who has passed away now, she um, co contacted social services and I was put into care 
um, because of the neglect um, that was happening. Mm -hmm. And then I was adopted at the age of, of six. Um, but growing up, it was something that I was always aware of. My mum was always open um, about it with me, um, especially the way it was kind of raised. Mm -hmm. And um, But I think I sort of kept a lot in for a long time. Uh, I was adopted, so I felt like a bit of an imposer on the family. Um, and I also felt very different because a lot of children my age didn't have to think about things like that. So it was, it, it was in your head then? Yes, you had, always. All these images and yes. things that had happened to yes. you? Yes. Um, it was something that I was trying to sort of process on my own and I didn't want to burden my mum with it, um, make why, her why worry. Was that? Why, why didn't you want to speak? Was it because you felt sort of thankful that you were actually yeah. adopted by the family so you didn't want yeah. to sort of bring more... Yeah, I, I, I was very thankful that my mum was able to um, look after me. She, I, I'm one of seven and mm. she's a single parent, so she's like a superwoman wow. <laughs> as it is. So yeah. I, um, and you know, yeah, so she, she was working sort of tirelessly to provide for us. And I just didn't want to kind of, I mean, it's not something you kind of talk over at breakfast, really. It's, it's, it's quite um, a weird thing to bring up. Mm. So, and I think for my mum as well, we spoke about it later on, but for my mum it was, although she was aware of it, it was something that she'd perhaps never had to deal with before, um, and, and it was obviously quite painful for her as well. Did you ever speak to anyone about it? Um, I, um, I kind of spoke to a few friends about it, um, not in depth, uh, sort of wrote notes during class about being worried about being able to conceive, this was like 11, mm. things that 11 year olds shouldn't be thinking about. Um, but not, not really, I mean, I, I was given the option to have counselling, um, but something that I didn't find very helpful. Maybe I wasn't ready to talk about certain things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I kept it in for, for quite a while. How did that affect your life growing up as a teenager? Um, how, old, how old are you now, sorry? I'm 23. You're 23, okay. Yes. Um, I would say, as I, I mean, as I said, I always thought about it, and I'd say getting to those a, the age of around sort of eleven, where you're starting to discover yourself, your body's changing. Um, I didn't really know kind of how to process all the information. I knew that I wasn't like the other girls. I knew that I, I didn't have a virginity to lose, so I felt really dirty, um, and I would sort of started um, self harming. I started smoking at eleven. Smoking at eleven. Yeah. Wow. And just on a self-destructive path, really. Um, yeah, that that was kind of how I dealt with it, and it kind of went downhill. What did you think of boys? Do you know what? Um, the kind of like reflecting on it now, boys. I didn't really, I always kind of had a lot of tension from, and I didn't really, um, kind of listening to your story saying not trusting, it was kind of the opposite with me. I found that like I trusted guys more. Really? Yeah. Oh, I don't know weird. why. It's something that I've kind of analysed more recently, and my kind of take on it is that because I knew my mum was supposed to protect me, I, I, I've had, I found it harder to to make relationships with women. Oh, right. So I had like okay. very, I've had very few women friends. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and guys, I knew what they wanted, and that was it. Really, it was just kind mm. of it was kind of there for you. Whereas women um, were, were not to be trusted. They were mm. supposed to do one thing, but did you know did something else? She was supposed to protect me. And it was it was as, as I got older and I kind of understood life, and I realised that she wasn't well, mm. um, and she, she you know she, she probably did the best that she could, um, and she wasn't able to look after me. She wasn't able to look after herself. So. Mm. Or something so else you got you were quite close with, with boys then. Yes, I was perhaps too close. <laughs> no. um, I, I just didn't value myself. Um, so I, as I said, I didn't feel like I had a virginity to lose. So I just kind of um, was was there to be used. That's what I thought I was. I thought I was so, soiled goods. Um, I'd been told before, so I just kind of didn't really value myself or um, yeah, I didn't try to preserve myself. But wasn't that making you feel worse, though? Like it was. It was. It was like a kind of vicious circle. So mm -hmm. I felt awful in the beginning. Um, sleeping around didn't make me feel <laughs> any better. Uh, mm -hmm. It didn't pr improve my self-worth. In fact, it, it, it made it kind of go, go down. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you were telling me earlier as well that you got quite addicted to a few things. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah. So, as I said, I started smoking when I was 11. I finished, stopped smoking when I was about 19, so for about nine years. Mm -hmm eight, nine years I was smoking. Um, 
uh, in that time, I'd sort of started smoking cannabis as well. Um, and and I, I mean, I wasn't a heavy drinker, but I'd, I'd kind of go out and, and try to forget things, really, as, mm. as a lot of young people do these days. And Peter, this is the road that you went down as well, isn't it, with the alcohol? Very much so. And um, again, it's, it's common to a lot of survivors to, to use all kinds of crutches. And in my case, it's, it's, it has been alcohol. And, I, you know, I'm, I think for the rest of my days, I'll be conscious that, that alcohol could get a grip on me if I let it. But mm -hmm. it's just f amazing listening to Stephanie because she's an incredible example of where clearly something should not have happened. Her kind of early start in life should not have happened. But she's yeah. only 23 mm -hmm. and I've just spent a bit of time with her and she's turned her, her life around already. Has, it just yeah. goes to show that, you know, a abuse doesn't have to affect you for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And I think she's an amazing example of someone who's going to be a great advocate yeah. for speak, speaking out. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I, I thought was interesting is, is this thing about trust coming back to um, Stephanie being able to relate to women or rather to men as opposed to women because mm. it was a, I, I'm kind of a bit the opposite because men abuse me. I've always tended to shy away from relationships with mm. men or friendship should I say um, whereas I'm more comfortable with, with women yeah. because it, it was men that hurt it's me. It's people in different ways, doesn't it's, it? Exactly, exactly. So I've never, been, I've never been a guy that's got mates, as it were. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I don't go down the pub. Yeah, yeah. I don't go to the football. You know, I, I, I prefer to sit and talk to you mm -hmm. or to Stephanie than yeah. to be with a bunch of lads <laughs> doing the macho thing. Do you, know, yeah. do you know what I'm saying? Plus, I'm too old to do all that anyway <laughs> now. But, you know. but, yeah, alcohol is definitely something at NAPAC we hear from many people who are struggling with, with addictions of various kinds. Tell us a bit about uh, NAPAC and what, what you do there. Well, NAPAC is, um, is, is a national charity f and we have a free phone helpline mm -hmm. which viewers can get from our website which is napac.org.uk. It mm -hmm. operates every day. It's a free phone number. Um, we start from 10 in the morning. We go right through till 9 at night. Mm -hmm. And as I say, it's a free call. It's for adult survivors of child abuse who can call us. We, we listen. That's primarily what we do yeah. because many of the people who call us, you know, Stephanie is, is 23. Yeah. We hear from people who are 50, 60 years older than Stephanie mm -hmm. and have never spoken about yeah. what happened to them. So our, our support team, who are all volunteers, are trained to listen and to, to give whatever kind of support in mm -hmm. the moment people need. We send out information. We say very simple things, actually. We say things like, it wasn't your fault. We say and things like... I've heard that so many times that the, the person that's abused blame themselves. We do. We do, very often. We Did do, you don't as well, we? Stephanie? We feel yeah. that there was something, yeah, why, why something brought yeah. it on, something we got wrong. Yeah. That, you know, that is just that, a child. Ex exactly, exactly. We know that now as adults, mm. we can, but as a, as a child you carry that mm. burden. You know, child abuse is, is a crime that is unique in so many ways, including that it leaves the victim feeling responsible. Mm. You know, if you're mugged, if you're in a bank and it gets robbed or something, you don't tend to feel responsible for that. But when a child is violated, the child often grows up feeling that they were somehow responsible She's and carry so the shame angry. and guilt, which belongs to the yeah. abuser. And abusers are very clever at passing that buck yeah. over to their victims and silencing their victims in, in, in some ways. When, when you say that to people, does it, does it help them to actually Absolutely. realise, look, Absolutely. it wasn't your fault, you had nothing to do with it, you were just a child. Absolutely. I, you know, those words of it wasn't your fault, you're not alone, they, that we hear people break down and sob because they've never been told that mm. and those words are so important and they're true. And um, we, we, had, um, we run support groups at the charity as yeah. well. Uh, very well structured support groups, very well facilitated, structured, safe. Mm -hmm. And every member of the group is, is interviewed so that they are a good, mm -hmm. solid group. And there is one wonderful lady who did one of our groups a few months ago. And in the, the feedback evaluation form of hers that I read, she said, I'm 69 years old. She said, all my life I've hated myself. I've hated myself. And now, at 69, I love myself. Oh, 
just because she's yeah. done our course, just because she's been with a group of other people yeah. who are the same in terms of their experiences and has been given permission yeah. to move on and oh, to say that all that dreadful right. stuff that happened wasn't your fault. Yeah. Leave it where it, you know, put it in the bin. And we, we have people, they will write a letter to their perpetrator. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the perpetrator's long dead, yeah. but they can still write that letter telling them to pick it off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Put it in the bin, and, and then move on. And move on. That's great. Yeah. Brilliant. Stephanie, how did you move on? Um, I was fortunate enough to have a family who is very supportive. Not everybody mm -hmm. has that. Mm. Um, I've attended a help centre who um, they've offered me kind of free counselling, one-to-one -one advice, as and when I need it. Not kind of shoved me in that direction. Mm. Um, which has been really, really helpful, kind mm -hmm. of instrumental in, in my development and my growth. Mm -hmm. um, as well as friends who, who have been really supportive, um, mm -hmm. somehow managed to find myself in people, with people who have been through similar things and we've been able to kind of talk through our experiences. It helps so much to talk, it, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it really does. Yeah. Especially as women who like a good old chin wag, don't yeah. we? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's okay. what's really helped me. Now, now Peter, this says well that you two, oh, you tell the viewers as well about what happened when you confronted your abuser. Uh, well, I did. Two minutes left. Yeah, not 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 many years ago. Yeah. Um, I did go and knock on the door of the, of the man who abused me, who isn't really a part of my family anymore. Mm -hmm. So you can work out who it might have been. Um, uh, but I just felt I needed to go and look him in the face. Yeah. And I did. And although he couldn't look me in the face. I just wanted to say those words to him. Why did you do what you did mm. to me? Of course, he has no answer. All he had was abuse. Um, but it was, although I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to survivors to go and knock on the door of your abuser unless you're feeling very strong and supported. For me personally, it was one of the most liberating things mm -hmm. that I did because up until that moment, he still had a power and a control over me. Mm. And, and just looking him in the face as a, as a, a man looking at a much older man mm -hmm. who isn't powerful and over me anymore. You know, I was a little child and he was someone in his 30s. I was, you know, four stone and he was a 30 stone rugby player or a 20 stone rugby player. Mm -mm. Now the roles were reversed. Yeah. And if I'd wanted to batter him, I could have battered him there and then. But I wouldn't waste my, you know, mm. I, I wouldn't want to waste my time mm. on, a, on a piece of dirt like that and mm. I certainly wouldn't want to end up in prison mm. um, denied access to my children it wouldn't it wouldn't have helped anything you were the bigger man then but the man yeah. is still on the police radar anyway he's right. he's still they keep an eye on him because he might be an old man now but doesn't mean to say he's still not a danger to mm. children mm. that's right Okay, so we're going to go to a quick break. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, you're going to stay with us. You're going to stay with us as well, Peter Hope. And we're also going to be bringing on Julia Webb Harvey, who's going to be speaking to us about another great charity that helps um, parents as well, whose children have been through something like this. So do join us after this. Welcome back. We're, we're continuing our discussion about child abuse and we've got two, so I will call them survivors here because I think they've done great. Both of you, you know, you're, I think you're amazing to come and talk about this. Great what you're doing with the charity. Great, Stephanie, that you are, you know, you have moved on and you are speaking out about this as well. And we also have now with us Julia. Julia, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. Can you tell us what you do, Julia? Um, I'm a trained psychotherapist and I've worked with an organisation called Mossack um, mm -hmm. who work with the, it's a, it's a very complicated way of saying it, but I, we work with the non-abusing parents and carers of children who've been sexually abused. Mm -hmm. So those children that are coming through recovery, um, so supporting mm -hmm. the families. Um, what's it, I mean, what's it like for a parent? So that, you know, a parent that's shown so much love and support to their child and then they find out that their child was abused by someone, maybe a family member or some, you know, a nanny or something. What's it like for that parent to go through that? to it, find out. It's totally devastating, Chrissy. Um, it's, uh, I wish I could give you a kind of blueprint to say mm. what it's because it's every, every person is different, every parent is different, but generally all, all the parents that come through Mossack are very, um, they feel very ashamed, they feel very guilty, they feel that they've 
they've let their child down. You know, the one thing that mm -hmm. parents should do in our society is look after children. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, there's been an, an abuse that they really, really haven't known about. Um, mm -hmm because most of the time it happens within the family mm. context. You've heard two stories here. Yeah. That's, that's true of over, well, I should think, 95% of the cases that come through Mossack. Um, do, do, you think, do you think parents sort of are more careful with strangers, say, rather than... I, th I, think, I think as a society we like to think that, that bad, bad people look like bad guys. You mm. know, we're looking for the child catcher um, from Chitty Chitty mm. Bang Bang, mm. the monsters. Mm. Mm. Um, but, you know, that stereotype it simply doesn't exist mm -hmm. um, in most cases of abuse. It's people that mm -hmm. are known within the family networks, people often that the parents have welcomed into the family. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's really... Stranger danger is a part of that, and there are some truly evil people that do spectacularly horrendous crimes like As recently. we heard, within, yeah, the 11-year-old yeah. girl that was raped, right? Yeah. Or, or the gangs, you mm -hmm. know, predatory gangs. Mm -hmm. But those, those are, those are, un, you know, those are unusual mm -hmm. um, statistics and stories. But mm -hmm. they, they kind of tend to be portrayed in the media a lot because they're sensational, and mm -hmm. really nobody wants to think that actually it's it, it's going on within the family environment. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, it's quite hard. To, I can imagine how hard it must be for, for parents, and I'm sure there's loads of parents everywhere that are watching now and, like, you know, recent things that have been in the news. It's, it's hard to know how much to kind of trust people, family members, because you don't want to start now being suspicious of Uncle Tom no. or no. people that are probably innocent, but then you, you kind of... I can imagine how difficult it must be for a parent to kind of trust people now mm. with all these things going on and finding out all these things. Yeah. Um, it's it's a, it's an impossible um, thing to resolve, really, because you don't want to be suspicious of everybody. Yeah. But at the same time, you, you know, every every parent has there's a parental responsibility to look after their own children. So it's about really knowing your own children, trusting your instinct. A lot of the the the, the parents that that come to Mossack say, "Oh, I wish I'd listened to myself. I wish I'd." you know, picked up on something or, or noticed threads or mm -hmm. noticed a change in behaviour. Tell, tell us about, tell us some of the signs maybe that parents can look out for. Oh, again, I wish I could give you a list that, you know, your viewers could then take yeah. away and tick things off, but it, it, it doesn't work like that because some children, some children withdraw a lot, so mm -hmm. they, 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 they shrink into themselves, they become the sad, mm -hmm. quiet little child. Mm -hmm. Some children go more delinquent, so, you know, kind of go off the rails. Mm. So there's... Um, but they can become... There's always a reason for that, isn't there? Because sometimes parents will say, oh, you know, my kid's just been a teenager mm. or, you know, my, my child is just misbehaving. But some, often it's not just... They don't just do that for the sake, especially if they've brought, been brought up well. Yeah. They don't just go off the rails for no reason, do they? There must be something there. I, th I think, yeah. as, as, as Julia was saying, that there, are, there are signs and symptoms and individually... They may mean nothing. You know, mm, yeah. the, the quiet, reserved child on Monday morning at school might simply have not got the toy for his birthday <laughs> that he was yeah. hoping for and he's a bit cheesed off. Mm -hmm. But if it's consistent behaviour yeah. mixed with other things, yeah. then society needs to be looking at that. That's why mm -hmm. we all need to be far better educated about these issues because we're not really, yeah. you know, we don't know what to look out for. And it's all there, you know, it's all accessible on the internet. We can mm. find out from organisations such as Mozak, which is an amazing charity mm. that we've worked with for many years, or the Childline, NSPCC, Stop It Now, NAPAC. There's lots of information out mm. there that people can, can look at. Yeah. Um, and it is such a shame, I think, that, you know, again, going back to childhood, I can remember falling over in the playground at school as a, as a child, perhaps, and the dinner lady would pick you up and put you on her knee and mm. make you better sort of thing. There's no, nothing wrong with that at all. Mm -hmm. And yet that's all gone now, mm. hasn't it? Mm. Because we are so kind of wrapped up with, you know, sort of over the top, if you like. Yeah. And, and I think that is, that is a shame. And again, that's because abusers are winning, you know, because most children are safe. Most people do not hurt children. 
but it's important that we look out for those signs and symptoms. I know exactly what you're saying, because sometimes, know, like my husband, for example, if he sees a little child, he'll just sort of start messing around and poke his tongue out and stuff. And I said to him, Michael, don't do that, because people might think, you know. But it's obviously, it's, it's completely innocent, but sure. then I, I, I feel uncomfortable if I see him doing something, like, because I, I know how maybe people would perceive it and how parents mm. would feel, because I know mm. maybe a lot of, sort of parents might be suspicious. So mm. it's, it's horrible that we've... Mm society sort of becoming like that. Mm. It's, it's but it's horrible. another illustration, isn't it? And that's the stranger, you know, fear the stranger, yeah. fear, fear the, the, the mm. unknown person to mm. the child. Mm. And, you know, forget about, you know, the babysitter or, or, yeah. or the, the, the person that the child becomes edgy around or doesn't want to go to or mm. wants to spend too much time with, mm. you know, because they're getting lavish with gifts. Sure. You know, it's just, there's, there's no, there is no blueprint mm. on, on what a child behaves as. but. You know, a parent really, really can trust trust their own instinct. And if they're yeah. worried, at all worried, pick up the phone. Mm. Talk yeah. to talk. Pick up the phone to Mossack. You know, that's how, exactly. How do you help parents? There, what do you do? Um, we deal with a whole range of things. So there's a there's a national helpline, rather like NAPAC, but you know, dealing with the the, the, the parents of children who've been sexually abused rather mm -hmm. than survivors. Um, and the, you know, there's they're fully trained qualified helpline people. There's a counselling service if anybody's in and around mm -hmm. South East London, although people come from further afield do. We offer play therapy to children because often we find that if, if the child's getting support at the same time as the parents, then yeah, the kind nice. of rewards can be mm -hmm. really quite amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a wonderful, wonderful lady called Lucy who's doing um, amazing things in an outreach service. So mm -hmm. on an advocacy side, kind of battling for the parents and yeah. fighting the horrors of the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. but, okay. but that's another, <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me that's on another that. show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, during, during the break, we were, we were talking about how I'd met a convicted child abuser yeah, um, who, who rather amazingly point, pointed out that you know, one of the greatest or the greatest deterrent to him as an abuser was for his victims to speak out. Mm. Obviously, because they don't want to get caught, yeah. but also for survivors to speak out. And I actually think if there is a silver lining to all of this, and the mere fact we're having this conversation mm -hmm. tonight here, is that abusers out there will think twice. Yeah. Yeah. They'll think twice because at long last, society is listening. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really, really important. It's it doesn't mean children really necessarily are going to flock to Childline tomorrow, yeah. but I think abusers... Adults will think, oh dear, maybe. We have to keep drumming the point, don't Absolutely. we? We have to keep this Absolutely. going because it, we don't want to just, yeah. just because it's in the headlines now everyone's talking sure. about it. But there's something that need, we need to continue so, doing. So many journalists and broadcasters over the last few weeks, Chris, when I've done, you know, our charities had a lot of attention from mm. the media following the Jimmy Savile thing. We've been negotiating with the BBC, you know, because they have a sense of responsibility for what's happened, obviously. Yeah. And um, so many times after interviews, whether it be radio or TV, I've had people say to me, this is more than just a news story. This is about how we treat our children. Yeah. This is about child abuse that's gone on since man was on the planet, as it were, and it's got to stop, mm -hmm. you know, and it can. And it's, you know, 50 years ago, it was okay, apparently, for the husband to go home and beat his wife, mm -hmm. because it was accepted, mm -hmm. because it was, you know, well, it was his right. Yeah. It was never his right, but that was society's view. Yeah. Well, it has to be the same with child abuse. We can, you know, I'm not saying we can eliminate it 100%, probably not, but we can do a lot more yeah. than we've done. We have to do everything that we Absolutely. can. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. What do you think stops people from speaking up? Oh, um, as children or? And adults as well. Uh, I it's impossible to generalise again, but mm. the fear, mm. fear of um, letting your family down or, or a lot of children are frightened that they'll be taken away, yeah. the parents yeah. will be taken away, yeah. they'll be put into care, they'll be put into prison, the police, the bad guys will come around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and often, you know, it, it, it's wrapped up in, in love as well, a sure. kind of perverse, twisted view of love. So. Sure. A lot of children feel very attached to the perpetrator as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not it's not it's not one thing that you can identify really, but this kind of great mm -hmm. complexity, which in in a when you're a child, I mean, we're having a very adult discussion. But if you're a child with no language, it's five, six, seven. Mm -hmm. 
you you how can you know you you can only act out yeah. um, your your angst. Sure. You can't mm -hmm. you can't verbalize, verbalize it. it. Um, coupled with that, with you know, parents are busy, busy lives, people rushing around. You know, mm -hmm. so um, I think it's very easy um, for things to be isolated. And then when parents discover that their children have been sexually abused, who do they talk to? Mm -hmm. who, who you can't That's share that, in the, that on the, the school game. To exist yeah, exactly. It becomes sometimes the sort of the focus is on the kids, how yeah. to help them, but the parents go through hell as well. Yeah. yeah. Awful. Um, terrible. Yeah. Which is why, um, through Mossack, I, I wrote the book that I did to tell the story mm -hmm. of what it's like to be a parent that's mm -hmm. sexually abused your child, because there's, there's, there is a lot of material mm -hmm. from survivors out there, but yeah. um, truly horrendous stories, mm -hmm. but, but nothing that's kind of practical or just yeah. the story that gives somebody else a pathway to believe mm -hmm. that, that recovery can happen, and recovery does happen. Yes. Two so great yeah. examples here, but that's true of families. Mm -hmm. Families you know, do recover. Mm. There is life after abuse rights, definitely. Yes, there definitely is. I think um, what we were saying earlier about kind of disarming the perpetrators and speaking up, mm. um, the, the victims have power. They, they don't realise it, but they have mm. the power over their own lives. Mm. Um, that was taken away from them yes. at one point of their lives, but yeah. they can regain that. Um, and just, just by overcoming the fear of the perpetrator, mm -hmm. Um, enables them to, to, to be empowered, to take back control of their lives and, and to possibly bring, bring those people to justice. But sure. if not, give them the strength to, to get on with the rest of their lives mm -hmm. and, and help those who, who may be going through what they once did. Mm -hmm. Power really is what it's about. Yeah. It's about the misuse of power. Mm -hmm. You know, power, secrecy, fear, these are all things that conspire to keep, yeah. to keep abuse thriving, if you like. And I think it. just, mm. yeah, and, and, and I just think it's amazing that people now are having the strength and the courage mm -hmm. to, to speak out. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm quietly optimistic for the future. Mm. Me but, too. Yeah, absolutely. We're on the right, right track, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know, I always say on this show, you know, if you are going through something, ne never keep it to yourself. Mm. I know when I was going through problems, I kind of didn't speak, I, I didn't go through abuse as a child, but I went through different kind of problems and I, I, I was sometimes afraid to to open up because one, I thought there wasn't a solution to my problem yeah. and I thought if I just, you know, start talking about it, I'm never going to stop crying. I was yeah. afraid of letting it out, but there's nothing that, you know, there's nothing good that comes out of keeping something hidden inside of you. Mm. You know, the best thing I did was to open up to someone and mm. get help, you know, and, and I was able to talk about my, my mm. issues and then I found that actually there was a solution. Mm. So I didn't have to keep carry on in those problems. Sure. So I think maybe a lot of maybe adults, the reason they've kept quiet for so long is because they think they, you know, they're not going to be able to deal with it. But mm. there are people that can help you. It's got two great organisations, as I said. There's lots of organisations out there. Mm. Please, please do speak to someone. Don't keep it hidden anymore. You know, it's probably ruining your life in ways that you don't even realise. Mm. So, so please do speak about it. And like I say, if you do want to get in touch, you know, if you want the, the information about our guest tonight as well, we'll be up on the Chrissy B website, chrissybshow.tv. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. <laughs> Thank you so much for, you. for sharing your stories. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Julia, as well, for your advice. Mm. And we will be back again on Wednesday, where this time we'll be talking about something quite light, which is kids' cooking and nutrition. So um, do join us again then. Bye-bye for now. Well.